Matthew Palmer to introduce our speaker. Thank you, Elaine. Welcome. Buenos dias. Good morning. My name is Beatriz B. Palmer, and my pronouns are she, hers, and ella. Um, and I identify as a Black Latina, Black Indigenous Latina. I'm currently uh, residing or sitting in borrowed lands from our Diseño Native American peoples. Um, I'm the program manager for the Service Learning and Volunteer Center at Miracosta College. And, um, you know, I help facilitate work um, between faculty, students, and our community. And today, it's such an honor to support this event, especially because I'm currently in my first year of my doc doctoral program at San Diego State University. And so thank you so much, Elaine, for inviting me um, into this good troubled space. Um, so uh, with that, I'd like to uh, tell you a little bit about Dr. Sean uh, Crossland. He's an assistant professor of higher education leadership at Utah uh, Valley University. Sean focuses on the public purpose of higher education and his teaching and scholarship. He earned a PhD in educational leadership and policy from the University of Utah, uh, Massachusetts in community or an MA in community leadership from Westminster College and a BA in psychology from Iowa uh, Wesleyan College. I hope I pronounced that right. Prior to joining UVU, Sean was the director of Thane Center at Salt Lake Community College. Sean has teaching experience with undergraduate and graduate community engaged courses at a community college, a research intensive flagship university and a liberal arts teaching. Welcome, Dr. Sean Crossland. Awesome, thank you so much. Um, I am really excited to get to chat with everyone today. Um, I, I started to get a little bit anxious when I was preparing and then I realized that they already actually gave me uh, my dissertation and my PhD. So um, I should be able to have fun with this. So um, awesome to see so many uh, familiar faces and, and, and some new faces. Uh, flattered that folks will take the time to uh, to listen to my uh, to listen to my dissertation dish today. So um, this is an outline of um, kind of everything that I'm going to try to to cover today. Um, when I was doing my work, uh, you know, people would say one one of the things that the challenge is to be able to get your to get your whole dissertation on a single slide. And and for me, that's I don't think that's really that's not really possible. So I tried to. This is this is actually from my dissertation defense, um, where I tried to to outline the um, outline the um, the whole thing. So I'm going to talk a little bit about how I chose De Anza College, what that looked like. I'm going to spend probably the most of the time today talking about my method of appreciative inquiry that I used, and then my dissertation took a took a four article format. So um, these are the four articles, and I'll I'll briefly talk about. Um, about each of those and some of the some of the key findings from um, from those. So, um, so the uh, so the way I got to De Anza is a is a fun a, a fun story. I think um, <clears throat> I was at a conference. I was trying to remember this morning. I think it was a league league for innovations conference, maybe in San Diego or something. This is several several years ago, probably eight eight nine years ago. Um, and I was at a conference and a few of us went out to dinner and I was talking about trying to start this, um, this leadership certificate at Salt Lake Community College. Um, one of the people I was at dinner with said, you've got to call Cynthia Kaufman. She's at De Anza College. You have to call her. Um, she's got this really cool certificate. You're going to want to learn and want to get to connect with her. So, so I cold called De Anza uh, one, you know, one, one day and I actually caught Cynthia on the first try. Uh, maybe this is back when people would like answer the phone and um, and, and we ended up talking, I, I just literally just cold called and ended up talking, I think for something like 90 minutes. Um, and she was really excited and asked me a bunch of questions about what we were doing and, and what we were thinking for, um, you know, for the certificate. Um, and she said, you know, if this is something that you're interested in, you really have to talk to Ken Rowling at the community learning partnership. So as soon as I got off the phone, um, she sent me a bunch of resources and sent me Ken's contact information. And Ken was based out of Chicago, so the next time I was home uh, visiting my folks, we uh, we took the train up. Uh, my mom and I took the train up and 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 sat with Ken for a couple hours 
um, in, in Union Station and learned all about the community learning partnership. And he learned all about my work. My mom kind of sat in the corner and knitted and periodically joined the conversation. Um, and so I share this because originally I, I, I thought about trying to approach my dissertation um, as a, as a multi-site analysis. So looking across the community learning partnership at the time, I think there were seven, um, seven member sites that all had some kind of, uh, of community change studies programming. Um, that became a little more complicated than, than made sense to, to try to fit into a dissertation. Um, so circled back with De Anza, um, and it was actually a really interesting time to do my to do my field work with Deanza because their um, their 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 longstanding president um, Brian Murphy, who I'm sure many of you are familiar with his work, um, had just retired, and so they were in this sort of interim phase. And so we decided that it made sense to um, to do my to do my field work at Deanza. Um, and the the top line is from Deanza's um, college wide learning outcome. So you can see a commitment to um, equity-based mindset and, and civic leaders in their, in their community. Um, De Anza has always had a very high uh, transfer rate in the California community college system. Uh, fun fact, they actually didn't know how good their transfer rates were um, until I was there. Um, they just always knew that they were in the top and they said, you know, it was good enough to say that they were in the top for, for transfer rates. Um, and I actually crunched the numbers from 1995 to, to 2010 and found that every year, um, they were in the top three of the entire California community college system for, for transfer rates. So that's a pretty, pretty remarkable stat. Um, and then, as I mentioned, the, the Leadership for Social Change Certificate was, uh, was really a, a primary interest of mine in my, um, in my research, in my focus. Wanted to learn more about what that looked like, um, what it looked like for the students, what it looked like for the community, what it looked like for, for the institution as a whole. Um, and then the last one is a is a, I think an interesting, something that really struck me. I remember uh, I was interviewing uh, Tom Izu, who was, was the, the director of the California History Center. Um, and he sort of described the arc of history of, of Silicon Valley as we know it today. That, you know, kind of started with the, with the gold rush in San Francisco. Um, and then, you know, a, a whole financial capital system was built on top of that. And then the semiconductor was was invented, and it became, um, you know, an epicenter, or probably the epicenter of the military industrial complex. And then now today we have this um, this overlay of of a social media empire. So um, so the the phrase the belly of the beast really you know kind of kind of gets it, um, you know, the heart of the heart of of, of capitalism of, of of neoliberalism of of all the things. Um, so quite a quite a fun and different experience for um, for for me who um, had spent the last several years in in Salt Lake City and outside of that had never lived in a in a in an urban or metropolitan area. Um, so this is my uh, this is my method uh, I used appreciative inquiry, and uh, it took quite a bit of work to. Um, to convince my committee uh, that appreciative inquiry was an appropriate method, uh, and then also to um, to establish how it fit into the larger kind of critical qualitative um, work. So, I think at the time I could find, I think there were three or maybe four dissertations I had found that referenced appreciative inquiry. Um, none of the dissertations that I that I identified actually tried to use fully appreciative inquiry as their method. So it took a fair amount, um, which ended up being really helpful for me to. Um, to sort of trace it into the arc of, of critical qualitative um, research. So some of the important um, aspects of it are that it is, it's, it's very much grounded in, uh, in constructive, constructivist grounded theory. So um, trying to, trying to um, develop new theory along the way. Um, it's positive oriented. Um, which I'll talk more about in a second. Um, that took a little bit of work for me to, to adapt that mindset. Um, and it's very, very participatory. Um, so every aspect of it is about um, all of the voices possible being involved. It's about you know, who, who, who should have some say in this, who is impacted by this. Um, so it's, it's at its you know, fundamentally participatory. Um, and then all the while it's focused on uh, on organizational change. So the, the desired outcome is, is organizational change um, at any level, uh, big or small. Uh, and these are the, 
these are the phases that um, the appreciative inquiry go through in this in this image that you're seeing. So it starts with defining, um, and this was this was one of the big challenges from a dissertation perspective. Um, I couldn't come in and say, here, these are my research questions that I have. This is what I want to study. Um, it was it was a, a co-creative process where, um, you know, I kind of said, I've got this idea. I'm really interested in learning more about De Anza in, in ways that, you know, my research could benefit De Anza and support De Anza. Um, and, you know, kind of broadly, maybe something around civic learning and democratic engagement. Uh, well, that quickly changed because civic learning and democratic engagement wasn't really the language that resonated with um, with the folks at De Anza that I was working with. Um, and so it kind of evolved into equity, democracy, and justice, which was much more in line with kind of how they thought about the work. So even, even that first kind of step um, was, was a co-creative process um, that, you know, that, that I couldn't just come in and say, I am the researcher and I am, I'm asking this question and I'm going to find out the answer to this question. Um, and the so the discover phase then um, I set out to kind of try to find all of the all of the best examples that I could find of what was going on around campus. So um, and so the discover is kind of learning, getting the getting the lay of the land. Um, the dream phase is around um, forward thinking and trying to trying to say you know if you weren't um, if you weren't uh, you know if you didn't have any barriers, what would the best case of this look like? And you know so thinking about the the leadership for social change certificate, for example, if there weren't any any barriers preventing that from being everything that you want it to be, what would that look like? Um, the design phase is is how to create sort of practical steps from the 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 dreams that people have idealized um, into a reality, into things that we could um, that we could actually move move towards. And then the destiny or the deliver is the last piece where um, you know all of this uh, ideally gets gets implemented in some in some fashion or another. Uh, so these are the these are the principles for appreciative inquiry. Um, and the I'm realizing now that my um, my slideshow is not doing what's supposed. That's okay. So there's five core principles for appreciative inquiry. Uh, the constructivist principle. Um, basically says that words words create worlds, right? So so how how we define things matters, and 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 very much towards um, what can what can be built from those. Um, simultaneity is around the idea that um, you know asking questions can necessarily um, create change. So the ways that we ask questions matter. Um, the poetic principle says that we can we get to choose what we study and what we focus on. Uh, the anticipatory principle is that um, is that images inspire accent action. So specifically, when I was talking about uh, that dream phase, um, having a picture of an idealized world um, actually inspires us to to act and to to try to move closer to it. Uh, and then the last one is the positive principle that I that I mentioned. You know, it took a little bit of work for me to to fully internalize um, both. Um, you know, as just as the person that I am, I I think you know people might describe me as sometimes cynical or um, you know something like that. Um, and then also in the context of the work that I was doing, right? That um, working working at a community college, working with with students that are coming from you know historical um, and current marginalized lives and. Um, you know, students that are living in somebody's garage, students that are, um, you know, reliant on the campus food pantry for um, for the majority of their of their nutrients that they get, um, people that are taking the bus two and a half hours to get to campus, all of these things, right, can be um, can be very much um, hard to kind of frame in a positive light without also feeling like um, you know, a sense of entitlement or a sense of of privilege of of me coming in from the outside and saying, look how wonderful things are. Um, and so as I as I worked to explain this um, to folks, both on my committee and, and then also, you know, while I was on the site, uh, I came up with a really good analogy um, about a driving lesson. Uh, you know, I grew up, I mentioned um, in, in rural Illinois, and we have these, uh, you know, we have these blacktop roads that don't have a center line and don't have shoulder lines. And, you know, if you're lucky, maybe you've got a foot of gravel and then it turns into a ditch. Right. And so growing up and my dad's teaching me how to drive. At first, when I'd come up on a curve, I'd slow way, way down, right? Because I didn't want to go off in the shoulder into the ditch and I didn't want to be too far over into the other side in case another car came around. 
the curve and he'd always be like, bud, like you got to go faster than this. It's not actually safe to go 35 on a curve, right? Like people are going, going 60 on this road, like you got to keep it moving. Um, and so the advice was to, to look at where you want the car to go, right? So look forward and, and actually see where you want the car to go. Uh, and that doesn't mean that you ignore the ditch and it doesn't mean that you ignore the truck coming in the other direction. Both of those things could be really harmful, right? If you, if you weren't aware that those existed, uh, but by looking at where you, you want the, the car to go, or in this instance, looking at where you want the research to go, um, um, gives a little bit more room. It, it helped for me to be able to, to sort of internalize that, um, that positive perspective. So um, this is a handout that I used both um, with my committee to get the green light to finally start um, the research, and then also as I got to campus. Um, and I'm not going to go through the whole thing, but I'll give you the kind of um, the index of it. So you can see the blue bubbles. Those are the um, those are the phases of of appreciative inquiry, and then the blue boxes above it kind of show the guiding questions. Again, these weren't my 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 focal research questions. These were the the the, the sort of broad questions that um, that I was thinking about as um, as I was in each of these phases. And then it also describes most of the methods that I used. Although again, it wasn't like um, explicit. I had to stay you know within informal interviews and email exchanges, for example, right? Like this was the kind of just how I was framing each of them. And then the, um, the orangish um, pentagons were, are the analysis that took place in between um, each of those phases. So I do a phase and then I'd have this analysis phase um, and I do another phase and I'd have another analysis phase. And each time there was a little bit of space in between. So my first trip to Deans, I think was only um, it was maybe like a week, um, and, and then I, I went back to um, to my work at Salt Lake Community College for for a few weeks, and then when the new semester started, I was there um, pretty intensively for the whole academic quarter with with a few times, um, like maybe a long weekend in between each of these phases or something that I would intentionally be gone from the site um, and go home and do you know do some analysis um, with with a nice with a nice buffer in between um, in between my. Uh, my site. So, um, so that I'll, I'll kind of leave my, my method there for now. Um, this is the first article, uh, and I'm super excited to say today that it's actually accepted in the upcoming uh, special issue for the, uh, for the Michigan Journal for Community Service Learning on uh, Civic Identity. Uh, and this is a co-authored piece. So I think I saw, um, I think I saw Angelica join, Angelica Esquivel, uh, and Benvo um, are are both uh, working on this new version with me, and they were also uh, co-authors on the um, on the chapter in my dissertation. So it was pretty fun in my in my dissertation defense to you know to be able to say, look, like you know, I have I have co-authors on this chapter of my dissertation, and at the time, two of them were community college students, um, which I'm pretty proud of. Um, not because I'm the one that did it, but because you know I believe that community college students have just as much to just as much to author off, offer and to author um, uh, than a you know than a doctoral student does. So um, so these are the broad themes around the people students uh, paper. This idea of the sort of balance between individual agency and institutional accountability. Um, so recognizing that yes, students have have a role to play and need to you know need to take ownership and. Um, and and uh, take a part, an active part in their in their future, and that also institutions have an opportunity to um, you know to create more structures and and possibilities for students to to cultivate that agency. Um, newness, belonging, and place um, were were three other themes here. So newness in that um, no matter what uh, background and lived experience a student had when they came to De Anza, it was a new thing for them. So even if they were you know, fresh out of high school, or if they were a returning student from from years past, or um, anything and everything in between, there's a there's a layer of newness that they all share. Um, this idea of belonging uh, being uh, being really a, a pre a prerequisite for for any kind of substantial change in their uh, in their civic identity um, in their sense of agency, um, and then place and what it means to what it means to be in a place and feel either a part of or or separate from. Um, from a place. So, so the, the, the kind of the driving uh, theme of this 
um, paper is that the student voice is, is requisite for, um, for an inclusive democracy, which, which hopefully we're trying to, we're trying to do at the community college level. So, um, oh, I meant to mention when I started, these are all pictures that I took on campus too. This was kind of a fun one. Um, I have no idea who this is. Um, I was just walking down campus one day and I, and I saw this and I was like, Hey, I'm not trying to be weird, but like, can I, can I take your picture really quick? And he's like, what? Um, okay. And he stood there and took the picture and I ended up sending it to him because he thought it was hilarious too, but that was kind of perfect, right? He's, he's got this sweatshirt that says illegal businesses control America and uh, the Pepsi truck in the background. So um, I probably should have, should have gotten his name, but I think it's, I think it's, he's fine with me using it. I know. And, and he's got the picture too. So the second piece, uh, the second article is called the people's college. Uh, and this um, this I did a lot of observation. I went to every faculty senate meeting while I was there. Um, I went to curriculum committee. I went to the equity action council, um, various department meetings. Um, if you want to raise eyebrows, um, volunteer to go to the curriculum committee. Uh, people will be really curious, like what you're what you're after if you just show up to the curriculum committee without being required to be there. So, um, so the the idea here. Um, is to, to highlight these kind of complementary and competing identities that, um, that De Anza holds. So De Anza is often referred to as the Stanford of community colleges. It's partly because of their proximity to Stanford. I forget, they're just a few miles down the road, basically. Um, partly because of, their, um, because of their high transfer rates. Uh, and once upon a time, uh, years ago, they really aspired to be that kind of exclusive um, you know, they were they were training engineers, they were training people that were going to go to Stanford. Um, and, and that is very much now somewhat contradictory to to their to their current vision of, of equity mindedness and um, and civic leadership. Right. So uh, another uh, another identity uh, shared among many of the folks that work there is is the uh, this phrase demanza right and so it's like the that there's always something more that's expected of you there's always something more that you have to be doing there's always um, you know always always more and more um, and then the third that I highlighted was this idea of democracy's college um, in part because of 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 uh, you know, Brian Murphy's work, but, you know, Brian Murphy would also attribute all of all of the work that took place on the institution as something that that predated him. Um, but Brian also uh, co-founded um, the, the democracy commitment. Um, so the this idea of democracy's college, I think, caught on. Um, <clears throat> so in in this paper, I identified a handful of of what I called levers of change. This is another expression from uh, appreciative inquiry that hopefully you know works to identify places that we can make intentional change uh, towards the outcomes again that that we want, um, and then a layer of this was about shifting metaphors. So rather than rather than saying uh, democracy's college, saying people's college because the emphasis there um, is on the people and on the students and on what matters as opposed to democracy as this nameless, faceless uh, institution. So, okay, so this one is a, is a lot. It's still a lot uh, years later. Um, and I, I was thinking this morning about the best way to, um, the best way to describe, um, you know, this one in a, in a short sense. Uh, this is a conceptual model that I made um, that, that represents what I think is, um, you know, what De Anza aspires to be at its best, right? So this is the, this is the dream of, of if, if everybody at De Anza got to snap their fingers and, and, and make the institution what they wanted it to be, this is what I think that would be. Um, I did, you know, I got some great feedback on this. It evolved from, from lots of different shapes and lots of different phrases and things like that. Um, one of the things that I, that I hope you can see here is that it's, um, it's designed to look like a, like a DNA strand, like a double helix. And so, um, part of the part of the idea there is to really emphasize that um, that organic and ecologic metaphor, uh, and then also acknowledge that all of this is interconnected. So we wouldn't we wouldn't think of of one piece of the one piece of this in isolation, but rather how it all fits together and and what it means for it to all fit together. In the background, you see three um, three layers, and these are all um, these are three different. Um, kind of pieces of experience. So the largest one is around the student's lived experience. And so that's their everything, you know, everything that makes up their lived experience, um, you know, family stuff, 
community stuff, political stuff, cultural stuff. Um, it all it all fits there, and it all um, it all warrants attention because it's part of it's part of who the students that we're um, that we're trying to educate are. The next uh, the next layer of that experience is the college experience. Um, and that's everything that that makes up their experience as the as a student of De Anza, um, and what it you know what that can mean. And at the very top is the is the future experience. So it's the aspirational, it's the um, you know it's the it's the what they want to be and where they want to go, even if they don't know what they want to be. And part of part of what De Anza is for them is that exploration of of understanding more about um, about who they want to be and and what they want to accomplish. Um, so those. Those kind of are the are the background for the model, um, and then I'll I'll work left to right, even though I you know stress that it's not necessarily linear. But um, so on the left we've got this um, human essentials. So trying to trying to further complicate uh, this uh, Maslow's hierarchy and um, and and what that really could mean for for human essentials. So identify that as bio biological, cultural, and material. Um, and those are, um, you know, one is not meant to be more important than the other. If, if you don't have, you know, the material needs to be successful as a student, um, you're not going to be successful as a student, right? Um, same with cultural, same with biological. So, um, so an example there was like food, food pantry stuff and, and whether or not there was, um, you know, accessible food that was, um, that was culturally relevant for students, right? That, um, may have may have religious um, you know or, or you know any kind of dietary stuff. So uh, the next piece of the model is around belonging and place. So um, having a sense of belonging, um, you know, feeling feeling connected, feeling like um, feeling like this is a place that that you're welcome and and a part of, right? Not welcome and an outsider, but welcome and um, that you can actually feel you know feel like this is a place for you. Uh, and then the idea of place being that that you also have the opportunity to shape it, right? So it's not just conforming to um, to the place as it was before you got here, but um, but that you that you have an impact on this place. That by being here, you know, you'd have an opportunity to um, to, to to leave your mark, whether that's a big or small kind of thing. Um, the middle um, the middle section is this uh, idea of where I where I leaned into the ergonomic. Um, idea that it could be adaptive and, and unique to, to individuals. Um, and there's three concepts there that it's ecologic, that it's empowering, um, and you know, it's it's education. That's what we're trying to do here. That's the work that we're doing is is educating. Uh, the, the, the fourth one is here we see the equity, democracy, and justice theme that I that I mentioned before. So so students really needing to be to, to have opportunity um, and have the capacity built to, to make their own um, their own definitions and their own concepts of, of equity, democracy, and justice and what it and what it means for them. Um, so um, obviously we have some suggestions and some ideas for for what that can be, but that it, it very much needs to be driven driven by the students and um, and in line with with everything else that we've talked about in here and, and, and fits with their lived experience. Um, lines up with their with their aspirational their future experience, and the last piece of this model is the idea of global consciousness and local leadership. So, so global consciousness is this sort of big picture systems thinking, um, situating ourselves in the world that we live in, um, and local leadership is the capacity to um, to to do stuff in our local communities that that aligns with that world that that we want to live in. So, like I said, I know I know that's a lot. Maybe that sparks some questions for the discussion thing, but um, it's hard to hard to summarize concisely in any um, in any you know short amount of time. So, um, so the last chapter um, was the I called the People Scholar. So this was a auto ethnography um, that took place throughout the process. So this is a uh, this is my field journal. It'll give you a glimpse of like how I approach things. Um, but this is this is the start of all of my data collection, and it's also um, some fun stuff. So uh, I've my my brother actually I might have stole it from him. I don't know if he gave it to me or not. But uh, my brother had a book by uh, Dan Eldon uh, when I was a kid, and Dan Eldon was a photojournalist. 
Uh, and he had a book called The Journey is the Destination. And there was this, this really cool, like he went on adventures and took pictures and, and kind of made collages with the stuff that he found. So that's part of how this was inspired. This is a parking ticket I got when I was visiting Brian in San Francisco for $76. Um, and, but then this is also like systematic data collection where here's a journal entry for April 16th. So, um, so how this all fits together, basically, you know, my field journal, um, I used strategically because I knew it would be less uh, disruptive in my data collection process, right? I can stand here and scribble notes as opposed to try to record something or try to type out notes as I'm meeting with people. Um, and it also kind of became my release valve as I was, um, as I was processing everything that I was experiencing and everything that, um, you know, everything I was learning about. Um, and so I've got, you know, there's a system of, of notes where I could, I'd make a little mark and I just say, okay, this is, I'm free writing here, right? Like this isn't meant to be data per se. This is just me like trying to, you know, trying to make sense of the world that I'm experiencing right now. Um, and so that actually ended up uh, converting, I think, somewhat well to, you know, to this autoethnography um, that tried to tie back in what all this meant, how all this, how all this connected, you know, what it meant for me to be doing the research, what it means for me moving forward, because at the end of the day, it was, it was a dissertation for me, right, that I did for, for a specific, for a few specific reasons, but um, okay, that's what I got. These are just some, some fun pictures and stuff from, from my time there. This was a sunset at Big Sur that I got to, you know, spend a couple couple days at, and um, I think that was actually from Sacramento, but the sign made sense. So, um, and my wonderful partner sent me with all these pictures um, to remind me that you know I had a I had a support team at home, um, and a really cool poem from uh, from one of the events at Dianza. So, uh, thanks for uh, thanks for for playing along. Hopefully. Hopefully there was something uh, useful and interesting in there, and I'll look forward to to what questions people have now. And I can close my share screen so I can actually see people again. Wow, that was that was beautiful. Thank you. Um, and now we want to. Um, welcome you to write down some questions in our. Um, in our chat, um, you know, share what what really stood out to you. Maybe some questions on the process. Um, I really appreciate Sean that um, when you mentioned the human essentials, you inclu included you know biological you know food that Maslow's hierarchy things that we need to survive. But you also included cultural. Um, I I. How was that received? Because um, usually when we think about care, basic needs, mm -hmm. you know, we think of like the food, you know, um, the, the funding, you know, the materials, but I don't know that I've ever heard it, you know, really uh, in, uh, in a holistic approach, including culture. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad you asked that question. And I can actually remember sitting in Cynthia's office kind of working through this, right? And, and talking about, um, we had just, so they were working on doing what they called like kind of, I forget the exact name, but it was like satellites. So they had the main pantry um, and then they would get whole trays of food that different departments could bring to their office, right? So students didn't have to go to the pantry per se. Um, if a student already goes to, um, already goes to Vita, then there's just food in the fridge, right? And they should get there at lunchtime, great, have some food, no, you know, no questions, but like I eat the food sometimes, right? Part of it was destigmatizing and saying like, there's food in the fridge, let's eat it, right? Um, and so, it, I mean, Cynthia and I were just really grappling with like, what it meant to take it beyond, like what, what we meant when we said, when I'm saying essential is like, we want people to thrive, right? Like essential is not, okay, you have just enough water to not, you know, die of dehydration. You have just enough food to not like so. Um, so the cultural piece was acknowledging just how meaningful and how important um, that is. Um, also towards the next step of a sense of belonging, right? Like if you're if you're satiated and you have your your nourishment, but it's completely outside of anything that you would identify as like part of of where you came from, it's not going to have the same impact as 
you know, something that that someone is in tune to to your to your cult cultural background and significance. So, um, so yeah, thanks for that question. That's there's a that's there's a there's layers to it as you can as you can imagine. Wonderful. And we do have a question from Kurt Larson. Sean, tell us more about the process of convincing your dissertation dissertation <laughs> chair that appreciative inquiry was the appropriate method for your study. And you kind of gave us a clue when you said, I had to do some work, you know. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Kurt, for that question. And you can you can see Dr. Parker also laughing on the side there. Um, so yeah, I mean, those that know me know I, I can bounce around a little bit, right? And I've been through I'd been through a few different um, methods that I thought were were maybe good fits, um, and and I can't remember. I think actually it was in a class with Dr. Yoon. I I came across this appreciative inquiry model, and and it was just like a it was like a one paragraph thing in um, in a qualitative research analysis book, right? And and it, it caught my attention, so I was like, oh, what is this? Um, and and kind of dove in and, and thought, oh, this is perfect, right? This is this is absolutely the the the, the thing for me because I don't I don't want to say this is my question. I want to learn as much as I you know as much as I want to research. Um, and so part part of the work was uh, you know part of the work was was Dr. Parker saying, all right, tell me how this fits in critical qualitative research, right? And I think he told me about a, uh, I'm trying to remember, it was a conference in 1992 and somebody was the keynote and he was like, find that and go from there. And I was like, what, <laughs> what, <laughs> you know? <laughs> and, and sure enough, I find the thing and it's like, you know, uh, it's critical constructivism and, and how, you know, critical constructivism pushes the boundaries of, of sort of more traditional qualitative research. Um, and that set me down the, you know, down the chain reaction of, of looking then at Joe Kinchelo and looking then at, at somebody else and, and, and really, if, you know, I didn't, I don't think I realized it at the time, but it was also justifying for me in a convincing way that this wasn't just because most of the applications for appreciative inquiry had been kind of more in the corporate world, right? We're going to, you know, we're going to make a well-oiled machine. Uh, we're going to do it in a way that feels more humanizing than people are used to in a corporate setting. And so they're going to be excited about it and more willing to buy in. Um, and, and doing, you know, doing that background homework actually forced me to realize what it could mean for me in terms of critical qualitative research as the researcher, as the one that was going to be, you know, shepherding this whole thing. Um, so, so when I got the background, then it became a matter of um, that map that I shared, I think, really, really laid it out to show, look, this isn't just going to be me kind of walking around, hanging out, asking people, like, tell me what would you dream up if you could, right, that it was systematic, um, that, it, that it had very intentional stages to, to move me through it in a way that I could also complete a dissertation, because that's obviously also Another concern is that um, you get so far into the weeds that you can't find yourself back out. Um, and so doing, doing that background and then also making that map that said, this is what it's gonna look like as best as I can define it. But in, in knowing that within those buffers, right, there's a lot of room, there was a lot of room for me to, to kind of do it and do it in my own way. So yeah, thanks for that question, Kurt, it's a great one. Here's another good question from Greg in the chat. Um, thanks for this, Sean. Regarding your process, and I think a lot of people can relate to this question, would you tell us a bit about how you balanced attending the responsibilities of your full-time job at the community college in Salt Lake with conducting this research and writing the dissertation along with other, all of other life's obligations? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so I, I actually took advantage of the staff sabbatical at Salt Lake Community College. Um, so my first visit to De Anza um, that I think I mentioned was like a week or so um, was in the spring. And then I got, um, when we hit Salt Lake's graduation, my sabbatical started um, and I didn't have to go back. This is funny. I basically took the summer off for a sabbatical, but because I was a I was an admin and not a staff. I didn't realize that like people take summers off all the time. That's just a thing that sometimes people get to do. Um, and so my my that was another that was a big 
a big challenge in even just aligning up all of the approval processes, right? Like getting, getting that stuff because it got to the point where it was like, all right, if I submit this paper to Salt Lake Community College that says I'm taking this time off, like I gotta, I gotta go, right? I've gotta, I've gotta be ready to to do my field work then. Um, so that that took a lot to um, to make sure it lined up. Um, and then honestly, the field work felt like uh, it was an adventure. It was so much fun. It was it was the most like. Um, you know, I just every day in my job was to was to wake up and learn and to like ask questions and, you know, go go to meetings where my goal was to learn from those meetings as opposed to like needing to facilitate them or, you know, um, obviously, yes, there was times that it was overwhelming and stuff. Um, and so then when the academic quarter finished, I had a month and a half, if I remember right, before I went back to Salt Lake Community College. Um, and I, I see Amy, uh, Amy's on, um, Amy Bergerson, Dr. Bergerson, my committee member gave me this book um, from Stephen King called On Writing. Um, and it talks about his writing process where basically, you know, he did the same thing every morning and he sat down at his computer and he wrote 10,000 words every day. I didn't write 10,000 words a day, but, um, <laughs> but that was like my, so during that writing time, writing became my full-time job, right? Like I woke up every day um and and wrote and wrote and wrote um so that I could have a solid draft ready when I went back to work because I knew if I got back to work I wasn't going to have the mental bandwidth and the time to um to get it to where it needed to be um <clears throat> so I mean during you know during coursework and stuff it was it was brutal working full-time and, and doing you know full-time student stuff um I got I feel like I you know I got lucky and I and I I played my cards right and lined out the the staff sabbatical to um to make the dissertation possible there's no way I could have done this study um while working full-time it just it wouldn't have been possible to do the to do the field work in the way that I did wonderful we have a question with uh from John Rife Sean your story about how food is distributed gives an example of what Danza is doing in alignment with your complex approach to inquiry. Would you share a few other examples of what you learned about how De Anza is going, is doing its commitment to equity, democracy, and justice? Yeah, that's a, <clears throat> that's a great question. Also, um, so things that come to mind, um, things that come to mind are, are the various um, events. Um, so, well, here's, I flipped to one, so HEFAS, which is the Undocumented Student Resource Center, HEFAS is a, a, a California uh, bill. Um, they have an annual conference, an annual summit. Um, and uh, I remember seeing the, you know, going, <clears throat> going to that event, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, <clears throat> and they had this amazing local artist that did murals and stuff and um, motivating this public speaker. Um, there's, they, they hosted a, well, this says the fifth annual Queer and Now conference, um, inaugural student leadership recognition reception. Um, so, so the, the events, <clears throat> I, they get, it gave me a newfound appreciation for, for the capacity of, of the celebratory function of, of all of the things, right. That, um, as an observer to get to witness, um, you know, people bringing their their family, you know, sometimes their parents, sometimes their kids, sometimes both um, to these events to be able to see like, look at look at this thing that I did here and these people are recognizing me for it uh, was just remarkable. Um, so that I think is one of them. Um, and that there's more in there. I just don't want to fumble through it. Um, there's a really good document that they they created. They actually finalized while I was there called uh, best practices and student voice and shared governance, and I I, I still use that today. Um, that basically, when I when I mentioned that balance of of student agency and institutional accountability, the document really speaks to that. So it's not enough to say, okay, um, you know, student government, you have a spot at faculty senate. Um, you know, you you can be here. You're going to be a voting member in faculty senate. They take it a step further and say. And as a member of Faculty Senate, you're assigned a mentor from Faculty Senate who's going to bring you up to speed on, you know, what is all of this, right? Because Faculty Senate is a mess and it's layers of politics and it's layers of, you know, different interests and stuff. And so, so they built that document around every kind of core committee that, you know, if committees wanted a member of the student government to be on the committee, 
they also had to assign a mentor for the student to uh, you know, to, to support the student to be able to actually make meaningful contributions as opposed to just saying, here, jump in the fire and figure out what do you, you know, what do you think about Equity Action Council, right? So um, yeah, great question. There's there's lots of lots of layers to that. Um, so I think we have um, time for just a couple more. So I'll ask this one in the chat and then I think B will wrap us up with the final question. Um, and uh, so from Tino Diaz, uh, thank you for sharing really good work on documenting your journey and studying how ideas like equity, justice, and civic engagement at the college function. I'm wondering if you felt like you had to offer a critique of current or traditional civic engagement scholarship to open this door. Yeah, Tino, great question. Thanks for being here. Um, uh, yes, I absolutely did, um, and I didn't. I actually I I debated on putting that in today or not, and um, so basically I um, in in part of my introduction before I get to why De Anza, I do a history of community college um, community engagement at community colleges and and what that means, and and it was really fascinating. Um, doing the research to write that history and how 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 white dominated the history of all of that was, um, and so absolutely needed um, you know needed needed the critique to to open the door in the way that I did, and and unfortunately it came really easy because there simply wasn't like uh, you know most of the histories written about service learning were written by white authors and, you know, framing it from a very traditional white student perspective. And, you know, I mean, Tino, you know, the whole cool kind of story of, you know, campus volunteerism evolves to, to community engagement stuff. So, um, so that was the, that was the sort of opening of saying like, you know, this is, this is why we need more ways of thinking about and researching um, civic engagement, because it is so far quite limited. Yeah. Great. Thank you so much for that. Um, I think that um, that was really uh, brave of you to include that. Um, so I appreciate that. Uh, my last question is: How did your practice? How does all of this research? How how did it impact your your practice? What what have you changed? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Good question. Um, it uh well i've changed roles since then um thanks amy um i've changed roles since then right and and there was a number of of factors involved in that and one of them was like how i want to feel at work right like um and and you know being a being now a full-time faculty member is much more in line with how i want to feel at work than it was in a in a really high stress high pressure administrative position right like yes i had the opportunity to make big impact and um, I knew that I wasn't making the impacts in the way that, that, that I really truly could because it was just a constant state of kind of survival mode. Um, the, in terms of my research overall, I, you know, now as a, as a faculty, I get to think about this stuff every day and, and, you know, I made this model that I can say, am I, am I trying to do this every day? Right. Am I, am I being attentive to to the human essentials of my students every day. And, you know, I obviously, I think I do better some days than, than others. Um, I was thinking as I was prepping that I was like, I should probably revisit that appreciative inquiry model and, and try to try to reground the, the positivity a little bit more. Um, but I think for me, there is a lot about um, balance and when, you know, when things can and can't be in balance, right? And even, you know, even though I, I had this limited amount of time to, um, to do my field work, uh, you know, I sent that, I posted that picture from, from Big Sur. And it was like, when I, when I took this little camping trip, uh, I remember talking to Cynthia and being like, well, what if I miss something, you know, while I'm gone? She's like, Sean, what are you talking about? Like, you're like, go camping, like you're in this most beautiful, you know? Um, and, and so recognizing that like, work isn't shouldn't for me it's not going to be about like self self-sacrifice to the point of misery right like I'm I'm always willing to put in the work and to you know to spend the time to do what needs to be done but but there's a fine line there of it also needing to needing to make sense for myself and um I think that's been I think that's been super helpful in 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 terms of 
you know, my life as a whole, but also my capacity to actually make an impact. So. Uh, so thank you, Sean. Um, and we'll save the chat so you can read all the comments that are being put in there for you to review <laughs> Thanks, <Tom>. later. <laughs> um, and I just want to say, I really have enjoyed this, not only your presentation and learning about your research, but I just appreciate, I always enjoy connecting with you and hearing your thoughtful reflections. And I love that you even showed us your, your journal. Um, so uh, thanks, and thanks for all the great questions in the chat. Um, uh, for those of you who, who contributed questions to enrich our discussion. So this, this actually concludes our formal Q&A session. And as I mentioned earlier, we're gonna have an additional 30 minutes for a deeper discussion um, for those who can stay on where we'll ask you to come on camera and mute yourself and actually have a conversation with Sean. Um, but I wanna plug, uh, a few reminders, um, as I said, uh, we recorded this webinar and it'll be available in about a week on our website in case you know somebody who missed it or